morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for worship. I'm Pastor Dave Wells. Glad you can be with us. I hope you find this a time of encouragement and growth, and I hope you find this a time of enjoyment, be it through the music, the message, or just a sense that you are part of the community of people who are Arlington United Church. We are a group of people who are the presence of Jesus in this community of Arlington. God bless you today as we worship. Once again, it's great to have you with us. Thank you, B. The scripture text that we have this morning is found once again in the Gospel of Mark where the lectionary has us journeying this year. I am looking at the Gospel of Mark chapter 10 verses 17 to 31. A passage which I am thinking is familiar to, uh, if not all, certainly most of us. Matthew and Luke also have this story with a little bit of a twist to it, but sometimes called the story of the rich young ruler. <laughs> so here we go. Mark chapter 10, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, and honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Peter said to him, We have left everything to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in the present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and, and with them persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. We'd better pray <laughs> once again. Lord God, this story, just a short story in your life of ministry, a young man comes to you with a question, and yet, Lord, the truth that is contained here on multiple levels, Lord, we pray for insight, and Lord, I pray, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, once again, be acceptable in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In your name we pray. Amen. I think each week that I have a message to prepare. A moment comes when I'm sitting there at my keyboard what am I doing? <laughs> Who am I to think that I have something to say to you or to me or to the world? 
Where do people go these days to get information or guidance or inspiration? There was a time, of course, when people heard everything by word of mouth, oral tradition. And, of course, we're going back a long, long time. And then maybe some were able to read and write and they got something through written words or through the newspaper. And then, of course, not all that distant history, along came radio and we heard it. <laughs> I still remember eating breakfast with that old little Philco wooden radio that mom and dad had and they'd turn it on, the tubes would warm up and we would hear the news. And, of course, it was from overseas. It sounded like coming through a tunnel. But we heard the news on the radio or information. And then, of course, television came along. And now, <laughs> kind of on demand, you can go online and find what you need to hear, for better or worse, unfortunately. And we found out just this past week how dependent the whole world's culture increasingly is on what is online. And Facebook went down for a few hours. And people are dependent, businesses are dependent on that, apparently. I didn't realize that. We are dependent on so much. So what I'm saying is that it is so humbling to think that we can go back, humbling but also such an assuring thing to know that in here week to week or day to day if you open your Bible daily and you can find words of guidance Assurance, grace, inspiration, comfort, all of those things. And, of course, we find out about Jesus through the Gospels. The Gospel, life, new life in Christ. Well, last week's message, I called it a journey, a challenging journey, and I think it was. So I am glad to look at a different text today. <laughs> And this is kind of a return to a reminder of the limitations that we have as people. Mortals. <laughs> Flesh and blood. And what God can bring to us. And we're only human. Or maybe I should say we are merely human. I can almost hear the debate among some of my peers when I was in seminary. And we talk about, so what's the point in this certain passage? What's the point in this text? Is he talking about morality, about goodness? Or is Jesus talking about what it is to be rich and the danger of that? And I guess the answer would be yes, it is both. For there is a link, I think, between our morality and our wealth. Being good is actually often closely related in the Bible, especially the Old Testament, with people who were righteous and who were blessed. Go to the ant, you sluggard, the proverb says. Consider its ways and be wise. Or this. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? <laughs> when will you get up from your sleep? Poverty will come upon you like a thief. And of course, we have our own modern day parables or proverbs, early to bed, early to rise, makes a man, women, healthy, wealthy, and wise, right? <laughs> the early bird gets the worm, and on and on our Proverbs go. Well, once again, one of the themes in the story of the ancient Israelites is also, if you live well, you will be materially blessed. And hence, if you have a lot, it must be a sure sign that you've been a good person, Okay? We see that again and again. It's a theme. And yet some of those sages, the ancient wise people who wrote what we call wisdom literature, they begin to question that. Being a follower of the one God is not necessarily a path to material wealth, they would see. I mean, look what happened to Job. He did nothing wrong and he lost it all. It's a great book of wisdom literature. But Jesus comes along again into the context of this tradition, and it's, well, it's a lot looser for Jesus. Jesus makes it clear sometimes that when good things happen, that's not a sign that you're going to be wealthy, or when you are wealthy that you've been good. And of course, neither is it a sign if something bad happens to you, an accident or whatever, 
then that is punishment. Jesus loosens all of that up. And he says, no, it's not necessarily the way. It's not about you. It's not about what happens to you. It's always about God, this life, this world. So this story comes along. Here is a young man who has it all. Did I say all? He's a really good man. He's a rich man. He's young and healthy. <laughs> and he is powerful. He's a ruler. Doesn't say all that in Mark, but you see that in Matthew and Luke's rendition of this story. So we call him the rich young ruler who happens to be a very likable guy. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus looks at him and loves him. What's not to like in this young man? Really, here's a young man who's healthy. He, he comes, he's sincerely seeking more in life. <laughs> Teacher, <laughs> respectful attitude towards Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, oh, well, first of all, let's clarify what you mean by good, okay? And Jesus says, okay, have you done these things? Or have you been obedient to the commands? Do, have you, you know, no murder, no, no adultery, no stealing, lying, or cheating. Have you honored your parents? And the young man says, teachers, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. And Jesus, again, loves him. But then comes the clincher. You want more? <laughs> Jesus seems to be saying. You want real life? You want eternal life? Give it up. Give all your money away. Give it away to those who need it. And then come and follow me. What an invitation. <laughs> come and follow me, but only after you give it all up. Pause button here. <laughs> Think about this. Reflect about this. Here you've done well, and you've saved, and you I don't know what the story, the history of this young man was, but Jesus says, give it all up, but then come and join our crew. Come and follow me. Would you do that? Jesus doesn't say that, that is, give it all up, to every wealthy person he meets. He doesn't say that to Nicodemus, the Pharisee, who must have been pretty well healed. No, you, Nicodemus, you must be born again. <laughs> he doesn't say that to Joseph of Arimathea, who became another Pharisee, was a follower of Jesus. He was a wealthy man, and he gave his tomb for the crucified Jesus. He doesn't say it to his friend Lazarus, who apparently has a nice place out in Bethany, out in the country. Nice country home. And Jesus likes to go there, be with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. He doesn't even say it to Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus says, I will return fourfold everything I stole or cheated. And Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. But he says it to this young man, a rich young ruler. So there's a lot here that we can just reflect on. And, you know, it's fun to reflect, frankly. I think it's okay to do that as long as you realize what's a reflection and what is actual word. So I reflect on this. Maybe the man inherited his wealth and he could never really identify with those who had to work so hard for it. What do you think? <laughs> reflection. Or maybe he was a super hard worker and he valued his money just a little bit too much. Kind of like a Scrooge. Or maybe, maybe Jesus in finding this young man come humbly bowing before him, what must I do? And Jesus thought, now here is the guy that I want. I want, he will be one of the leaders of the 12, 13. <laughs> Sell all you've got and come follow me. No, we don't know. We don't know what it is. One of the commentaries that I looked at on this text suggested that the young man didn't really understand real righteousness. 
that he had done none of these things that Jesus points out. That is, he had, he had said no to the right things. He'd kept his nose clean. Okay? Didn't commit adultery, didn't commit murder, did none of that. Since I was a boy, I've been obedient. But he never really understood what it was to be compassionate or to be proactive in seeking justice and righteousness. That's possible too. But he comes to Jesus with such sincerity and Jesus looks at him and loves him. But after Jesus' words, the young man grows very sad. It's almost like the light switch is turned off. And here, this young man who has come to Jesus with so much energy and so much desire, suddenly he goes away sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus, no doubt, saddened too. And he takes this occasion to turn to the disciples and he says this. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And then Jesus even heightens how, heightens how hard this task is by this ludicrous illustration of a camel going through the eye of a needle. When was the last time you threaded a needle? Can you still do it? My mom would have me do this for her because her vision wasn't so hot after a while. And I, right through, oh honey, it's just to me. I can still do it with this eye. Not with this eye. I'm nearsighted here, farsighted here. So I can, I'm, not, I'm fine, but this helps a little bit when I'm preaching. But anyway, a camel's with the eye of a needle. No, and that's all I think it's meant to be. There's nothing else implied here, no passageway that camels would go. Jesus means this to sound as silly as it is. That's how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God, and Jesus means it that way. My personal take on this, and this is kind of a little bit more reflection, but given my 70 years, Wealth can do wonderful things. Riches, money can do wonderful things. But it also can be a powerful distraction from that in this life which is truly good. More than a distraction, it can even lead to the opposite of good. The impact of wealth is pernicious. That is, it has a subtle way. It seeps into our goals and our motives and how we respond to things. Wealth can do that. And I might even say that given time, wealth will do that. That's my reflection. Based on what I've seen, what I've reflected on in my 70 years. Of course, it doesn't really happen to us. Does it? No, we can manage. If I won the lottery, I'd be different. <laughs> I don't know. There is a great scene in that old, it is a musical made into a movie. One of my favorites, Fiddler on the Roof. Do you remember that? All those wonderful tunes. And the star of the show, Tevya, this Russian Jewish peasant. <laughs> By the way, in the movie, Isaac Stern is playing Fiddler on the Roof. Da, 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 da. Tevya, he is poor. Not as poor as his kids are going to be, <laughs> but he's poor, and he knows it. And he's talking to his friend one day, and his friend says, money is the world's curse. <laughs> and Tevya replies, so smite me with it, and may I never recover. <laughs> Ever felt that way? Oh. I would say that money is part of, uh, well, I don't need to, this, you know this, the unholy trinity, power, fame, and wealth. This is what Satan tempts Jesus with, remember. The power to be famous or to have it all. I would add a fourth, maybe call it a fearsome foursome, pleasure. Lump that in there with it. Here, 
with this young man, wealth matches up to power. He was probably famous, well-known to boot. He knew the good things in life. And Jesus knows that these are a major distraction from being his follower. I don't think I personally know, personally know anyone who has all four of these. Maybe you don't either. But we know of people who do. This information age has opened the door for some individuals to become world famous. Almost household names. And being world famous, they have become people of unimaginable wealth. And because they are wealthy, they have invented new technologies. Or maybe it's the other way around. New technologies. They are world-class influencers. And they exert tremendous, profound leverage over the world and the culture. And with all of this, of course, they can and they do travel to exotic places aboard mega yachts or their own private jets. They live in amazing ways. And we wonder, wow, what would that be like to live like that? And frankly, I am amazed that some of them manage their lives as well as they do. But very often we do see that there is heartache and sadness and sometimes incredible failures with people who have so, so, so much money. People who do win the lottery, I think it's a statistic that's almost invariably proven true. After a few years, the money is often squandered and they're no better off than before. Money can do that. Jesus seems to be saying that to the disciples. How hard it is for the rich. He doesn't necessarily say the love of money here. He says for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the older I am, the less I am inclined to draw a distinction between having money and loving having that money. I think money is that insidious. I think we need some, yes, to get along. Of course we do to pay our bills, to put bread on the table. But be very careful of seeking after money to get more and more and more. Jesus cautions us. I hear Jesus' words like this young man. A good person, Jesus loves him. But I hear his words and I know this. Maybe there's more of this young man and me and all of us than I'd like to admit. And maybe we haven't done some of these things that Jesus talks about. We're like the young man. We've kept ourselves pretty much free from some of these evil things. But Jesus says there's more. You cannot be good enough, in other words. I, I got this message when I was five years old. My mom took me to a midweek Bible service at our church and I still remember, clear as a bell, the pastor that night to a small, small crowd of maybe 15 or 20, midweek Bible study, Wednesday night at Leiden Covenant Church. Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you understood that you need Jesus in your life? That you need his grace, his presence? For you will never be good enough on your own. And we drove home from Leiden that night talking about this. And we got home, and I said, Mommy, I want Jesus in my life. And we prayed. And since then, it's been a journey for sure, but that's when it started for me. And I know, again, for it is by grace I am saved, that not of my own works, lest I should ever boast. Not by works. It's the work of Jesus. Salvation ultimately is a gift from God to us. We need Jesus. No matter how good we are, no matter how admired our friends might have us be, no matter how many lives we impact with our good deeds, no matter how impressively we may grow to be more like Jesus, no one is truly good except for God himself. 
and it is through God alone that we come to him. We choose to respond or not to respond. And that is our role in this. So I ask a simple question. Do you think it is harder to respond to God's grace when we are wealthy? Is it harder because we have wealth? That's what Jesus seems to be implying. I think we are all pretty decent people. I am, in a sense, preaching to the choir here. <laughs> I don't think we cheat on our income taxes. I don't think we cheat on our spouses, those of you who are married. I think if we happen to get a $20 bill in change at the grocery store instead of the 10 that would be coming to us, we'd probably say something. I know I have. Whoa. Uh, uh, I think <laughs> you might have given me too much. Here. I'm guessing that you have tried to be a good parent or are still trying, those of you with children. Good things all, and Jesus commends you for them. But good people that you are, whether you're wealthy or not, now we're talking about the goodness part, there can be a problem with being good. Did my pastor just say that? <laughs> yeah. There is a problem with being good because we can grow so confident on our own good living that we forget that we need God's grace every day. Or we forget how we have been showered with great blessings from the Lord. And we think that we have done it by ourselves. I think good people are prone to pride. And it's good to be aware of that. This is a theme in the New Testament we see Jesus touching on again and again. He tells the story of the prodigal son who repents, comes home, and it's the elder son that Jesus really says, watch out that you are not like the elder son who feels pride in all the good things that he's done and yet never given the recognition from Father. Jesus tells the story again about the workers in the vineyard who have worked all day. <laughs> Sounds like me. <laughs> and along comes someone, it's the last hour of the day, 5 o'clock, and they get the same wage that the long study workers do. And that's not fair. <laughs> but Jesus tells that story. This is something that uh, God is bothered about when we get proud, when we think we can do it ourselves. The simple phrase is God looks on the heart. God is less interested in some of the good things we do than we might think. God is looking on your heart. Sure, he sees the things that you do, but he also sees the things that you don't do. I guess a simple way would be putting not only the things that we don't want to do, but what about the things that Jesus does want us to do? May God give us strength and guidance and wisdom and insight in doing those things as well as avoiding the blatant evil. There is a bit of the rich young ruler in us. I think it's important for us to admit that. We have been incredibly blessed, each one of us, Wherever you are today, wherever health you have, however many years you have, whatever future you might have, however much money you have, we have been blessed. Part of that blessing is visible just the fact that we are here and you have good friends and you are warm. We have so much. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Let us never take them for granted but to recognize your love for us. I want to end this with these words. These are Eugene Peterson's words from Jesus' words to the disciples. Mark my words. No one who sacrifices house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, land, whatever, because of me will lose out. They'll get it all back. 
and multiplied many times over. And then the bonus of eternal life. This is once again the great reversal. Many who are first will end up last. And many who are last will be first. The young man here is first in danger of being last. And that is the problem of being good or being merely good to once again look. It's not good, it's God. That's where we go. Lord God, I need you to live in and through me that I might enter into your kingdom. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you again for this time. Lord, thank you for this story. Uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, this message. Uh, sometimes uh, unsettling. But Lord, we need to hear we need to hear that we need you continually. Thank you once again that you are always with us, that your spirit is always with us. And Lord, when you died on the cross, you died even for our pride if we just admit it and know that it's there. And we need you for our journey with you. Lord God, now bless us this week as we leave from here. May we go knowing our dependence on you, on your grace, and the growth that we continue to be, to come to, and being like you, but never without you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for being with us today at Sunday morning worship time. There are a number of people who are here in person. And if you feel comfortable, you are welcome to come. We, of course, continue to worship with face coverings, but afterwards we meet outside for hot coffee and Ruth's great cinnamon rolls. We recently have these big umbrellas, so whatever the weather, we're ready to go outside and we'll be having a lot of fun. Thanks again for being with us today. God bless you through this coming week. Go in peace.